Avoiding complications of intertrochanteric hip fractures. Complications of intertrochanteric hip fractures are common. Avoiding the complications may be difficult. Here there are some examples of the most common complications of intertrochanteric hip fractures and how to avoid them. Implant failure. In general, implant failures occur in the first three months and it is the most common complication. Tip apex distance of 2.5 cm or more is associated with increased failure rate of hip fractures. How do you measure the tip apex distance? You measure it at the AP and lateral views and the combined measurement at the center of the head should be less than 2.5 cm. If implant failure happens and the patient is young, then you will do revision or IF and you may need an osteotomy. If the patient is old, then you will do a total hip replacement, usually a calcar replacement. You have to worry about infection, you have to worry about dislocation, and you have to worry about the greater trochanter and its fixation. When I do revision, sometimes I use a fibular graft to seal the area of the failure and place the implant below it. So the fibular graft will act as a buttress superiorly. Implant failure can happen if the compression hip screw is inserted superiorly and anteriorly. In a osteoporotic bone, try to insert the screw posteriorly and inferiorly. This area probably have a better bone quality and I may use a mega compression screw. Another one is implant failure due to the use of compression hip screw in an unstable intertrochanteric hip fracture. Unstable fractures are usually comminuted in the posteromedial cortex. Unstable hip fracture can also be defined as a fracture with a thin or incompetent lateral cortex wall. A fracture through the lateral femoral cortex is a significant predictor of reoperation following open reduction internal fixation of hip fractures with a sliding compression hip screw. The stable fracture will have intact posterior medial cortex. The fracture is divided into either a stable or unstable hip fracture. A stable fracture will have an intact posterior medial cortex. And in this stable fracture, you will use a rod or a compression hip screw because there is really no difference between them except that the compression hip screw is cheaper. If the fracture is unstable, you should use integrate rod, short or long depending on the fracture type. In this unstable fracture, if you use compression hip screw, then the fracture will collapse into varus and retroversion with limb shortening and medialization of the shaft. The reverse oblique intertrochanteric fracture is only 5%, but we make a big deal about this fracture because if we use a sliding hip screw, it will create a lot of problems for the patient because of the design of the implant. So when the reverse oblique fractures are fixed with a sliding hip screw, the action of the device will cause medial displacement of the distal fragment rather than compression of the proximal and the distal fragments. So the two fragments slide on each other and not getting compressed to each other. In this reverse oblique fractural 
The oblique fracture line extends from the medial cortex both laterally and distally, and there is 60% failure rate when this fracture is treated with a compression hip screw. The reverse oblique fracture will have fracture of the lateral wall, and that may lead to collapse of the fracture, failure of the implant, limb shortening, and medialization of the shaft. What if you have a non-union with reverse oblique fracture? You probably will need to remove the hardware. You may need osteotomy to correct the shortening and the deformity. You may use an intermediary nail or other devices, but not a compression hip screw. Various may reduction of intramedullary nail fixation of hip fracture can result in implant failure. The most common mode of failure for the short and long iron rod intramedullary devices for hip fracture is loss of proximal fixation due to a screw cut out. Also, malposition of the proximal leg screw may result in cut out similar to that seen in a sliding hip screw. There's really no difference in complication or healing when you compare short and long cephalomedullary nails. Loss of lack of integrity of the lateral wall is associated with increased displacement, collapse of the compression hip screw. Patient with a thin lateral wall or an incompetent lateral wall has an increased risk of intraoperative or postoperative lateral wall fracture. These patients should be treated by IM nail rather than a sliding hip screw. How do you measure the thickness of the wall? The thickness of the wall is measured 3 cm distal from the innominate tubercle or the vastus lateralis tubercle and at 135 degree to the fracture site. And if the distance is less than 2.5 cm, that is a significant risk for lateral wall blowout and failure of the compression hip screw. In general, in hip fracture, the 2.5 cm is important because you want to be less than 2.5 cm in the tip apex distance, but you also want to be more than 2.5 cm in the thickness of the lateral wall. Another complication is perforation of the distal femur and keoli. It occurs following long arm rod due to posterior position of the rod entry and the mismatch of the radius of curvature of the femur and the implant. The mismatch occurs because the radius of the curvature of the femur is lesser than the radius of the curvature of the implant. Greater means straighter. So you're putting a straight implant in a curved femur. So you perforate the distal femur anteriorly. So if you have a straight rod in a curved bone and you start posteriorly, then you can perforate the femur distally anteriorly. When you use a long rod, check the guide wire in the lateral view distally. Also, make sure you check the position of the rod during its insertion in the distal fragment. Another complication is flexion of the proximal fragment on the left side. When you have a left hip fracture and you use compression hip screw, if the fracture is unstable, you may cause anterior spike malreduction, which means flexion of the proximal fragment due to the screw torque. Mortality rate 
is 20 to 30 percent mortality risk in the first year. The patient at risk is usually an older male patient, 85 years old or more, with intertrochanteric fracture. The mortality is more than femoral neck fractures, and delayed the surgery more than two days increase the mortality. Multiple comorbidities increase the mortality, such as chronic renal failure, lung disease, and congestive heart failure can increase the mortality. ASA 3 or 4 can increase the mortality. Surgery should be done as early as medical optimization is done. Try to have co-management with a geriatric service or a hospitalist. Hip fracture fixation within two days will decrease the 30 days mortality rate. The pre-injury cognitive and physical function is the most predictive factor of post-operative functional outcome of patients with hip fracture. Another complication is the deep venous thrombosis. If the patient had a fracture a day or two before arrival to the hospital, then you need to screen the patient for DVT and get a Doppler to be able to diagnose and treat DVT. Also, you want to document that this DVT occurs before arrival to your hospital. Try to suspect it, diagnose it, and treat it. Do not screen every patient with a hip fracture. In patients with hip fracture, the risk of DVT is high. Some form of prophylaxis, anticoagulation should be given to the patient. Both mechanical and pharmacological prophylaxis should be considered for the patient. Make sure that you anticoagulate the patient and if the patient has atrial fibrillation or artificial valve, then usually the internal medicine, the geriatric or the hospitalist will take care of prophylaxis for these medical conditions. It is better for the medicine service to assume the responsibility of all anticoagulation for this patient that has atrial fibrillation or artificial valve, because if you, the orthopedic surgeon, stop the anticoagulation in three, four weeks, as we usually do, then you may accidentally stop the medication that being given for the other medical conditions, and the patient will be totally uncovered, and the patient may get problems from that. If the patient has atrial fibrillation or artificial valve, don't get involved in anticoagulation. Let the medical team be involved. Ask them to help you. Let them manage that aspect. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.